Okay, so yeah, so uh, well, we've already done the lovely to see you all, but I think, but it is lovely to see you all. And um, yes, yeah, so what I want to talk is, is and not so much my research here, I mean, I'll do a bit of that as well, but also I, I really want to say this is our research. And, uh, and here I'm thinking of the foundry as a whole of mathematical research, of digital research, of computer computational research, and why it matters more than ever uh, during COVID times. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so obviously I can't even manage my PowerPoint, as you heard the little beep then when I got it wrong. I do that almost every time. Um, so yeah, so research in times of COVID. So I think, and you, you can each think about your own experience here and other people that you know. I think for some, for some people it's been easier. Um, you know, there's been less distraction. Um, it's been almost easier, I think, some of us found to have remote meetings with people. So you, you might sort of wait six months to arrange when you're going to go and visit somebody. And instead you say, well, we'll, ha we'll talk tomorrow. Um, more remote meetings. So I think most of us have had more meetings than ever. Um, but sometimes it's been easier to arrange some of those collaborations. So, so there's been some things that actually made doing research during COVID in some ways easier. But also for many, or for different ones of us at different times, um, there's things I think that's made it a lot harder. So obviously the changes in teaching practice, the time that's taken, um, internet problems. So, you know, we're all in the privileged area, I think, of the world, you know, in terms of our socioeconomically, from a from an internet point of view, but lots of us, I know, have had different, different problems. Um, you know, and you've all had the, the broken videos and everything else. Um, and again, this varies a bit on, on temperament here, and I think that's quite critical because we are all different. Um, so for some people, I think that lack of face-to-face -face contact has been really very, very, very hard. I mean, I think everybody struggles a bit with it, but for some people it's easier than others. You know, I spent three months walking around Wales virtually on my own, so I know, you know, so clearly I can manage reasonably well with that. You know, although I talk the, the leg off a don uh, hind leg of a donkey when I talk to people, but I think some people you'll really find a day without having that face-to-face -face contact really very, very difficult. And then of course there's all been all the anxiety, whether that's been about personal health concerns and shielding or whether it's about family members um, and also obviously all sorts of family constraints as well if you've got children and managing those um, other kinds of things like that you know maybe that other people in your family who have been having difficult problems it may not be health problems it might be uh, problems with jobs um, and stuff. so so I think there's lots of things that have made it a lot harder for many people um, and, and a lot of these things too are not hitting us all evenly. So some, some people have more problems than others. Um, there's also uh, some, uh, and facts, I was going to say suggestions, there is very, very strong evidence that it is hitting uh, gender differently, but it'll also probably hit lots of other uh, types of distinctions. Um, you know, and, and actually, when I was mentioning the face-to-face -face contest, point the anxiety as well, um, one of the things that's clear there is some people treat the sort of anxiousness of the situation um, you effectively do displacement activity and just work hard. <laughs> Other people just, it freezes. And, um, and again, I think there's some suggestion that that um, has, is related, you know, that personality thing is related to gender as well. So I think we're, we're seeing, you know, some quite marked problems in the sense that this might, as we go ahead, um, the way this is going to hit different people's careers. So I think there's a lot of things we need to be thinking of here. And but I, and I said this in terms of people, but I think each of us probably have had, you know, we'll have different average experiences, but I'm, I'm guessing a lot of us will have seen different paths. And I've, I've sort of tried to plot at the bottom, shall we say, my COVID path from a research point of view. So to be honest, and I felt utterly guilty about this, the first few weeks of COVID were fantastic for me from a research point of view, not from all points of view, but from a research point of view. You know, I was being more productive than I have been for, I don't know how long, um, years, years. Um, partly because, of course, the email stopped because everybody was so you know, busy just sorting life out, email stopped. And um, so suddenly I found I had um, the ability to think and to plan, to do work in, in clumps rather than broken up. Um, there's lots of anxiety, you know, I, I've had family anxiety like a lot of people have, um, not so much personally worried, but, you know, have family members who are elderly and in um, 
with health conditions, uh, other close family who are vulnerable and in difficult jobs. Um, but, you know, from a, from a research point of view, fantastic. That sort of levelled out after a bit as, as the emails started going. And every weekend then I kept having weekends where I was like coding like Billio and doing lots of little side projects. And, they, and then somehow or other, everything got back to normal. So it's like that for the people as well. And, um, you know, the backlog was always bigger than, so that's my low there. The backlog's always bigger than, uh, that I could deal with and the, the to-do list grows. Um, and then I had leave for two weeks, a couple of weeks, uh, weeks ago. So that's my little peak. And I'm hoping things are on the upturn now and that I can actually make tracks, but we'll see. And I think the really big tick at the end was a slip of my uh, pen as I was trying to draw that. But, you know, I'm talking today and, you know, uh, so let, let's be positive, so there. So anyway, but I said, I've, I've, there's a sort of a roller coaster there. And I'm guessing a lot of you had that as well and it's not been there's been some times when this has been really difficult and some things that have been made problematic other things have become easier than that and um, I think this is really important though because we need to be aware that each of us is in a very different position and so to you know have uh, you know a care to understand that you know when one of us is doing well another person isn't and some people have got very much more difficult situations than others um, so it's, in some ways, I, I've focused more on the difficulties. There's been some advantage, but also difficulties. But it's the research we're doing, as I can say, is more important than ever. I mean, it's important in a number of ways. Some, some obvious things, like some of the modelling. You know, I mean, here I'm looking not so much to the founder. I'm just looking widely across the sort of uh, digital, computational, mathematical sort of range of things. Um, there's clearly been modelling work that's been absolutely crucial in terms of the virus and the its progression. And this starts with perhaps the um, imperial model that, you know, although, although it seemed like kicking and screaming, eventually did seem to knock the government into action um, when it was, well, you know, probably too late in some senses, but it could have been a lot worse if they'd waited any longer. Um, and obviously since then, uh, lots more. I mean, you see this happening into SAGE and all the time. Um, online education, of course, has become really crucial. It's been something that's been sort of there for many years and everybody talks about it, but suddenly this has become a major uh, impact across society as a whole. So the issues about how we do uh, education broadly through online media are becoming very crucial. So there's obviously lots of digital challenges there. And, and in general, society, the digital change in society over the last six months has probably been at least as much as the last six years and possibly a lot, a lot longer. The acceleration of things that, you know, perhaps would have happened anyway, but has been tremendous. So again, that gives us challenges from a research point of view, how we help feed into that, um, both in terms of helping society now in terms of that, but also I think this is gonna give another kick to digital industries and therefore the kinds of um, work to be open, open there. Um, the counter side to that is we've seen large amounts and, and exposed the existing digital exclusion in society. So, um, so things like the, um, and now I'm going more local into Swansea, but the um, project oh, Habit, it became very clear there that they were dealing with schools in relative deprived areas of Swansea when lockdown happened, um, the schools reporting that large proportions of their pupils just did not have adequate access to digital materials to work digitally. Um, less about our research, although there's an about that, but perhaps more from our teaching point of view. Um, a lot of young people are, are, I mean, there's both, they've had, if they're the, the new students, the traumas of the whole the A-level issues and that kind of thing, um, coping with um, the last, you know, that shift during the end of their schooling and the anxiety related to that, to digital teaching. Um, um, but also worries about jobs in the years ahead. So I think we've, we've got a really important role in just giving hope back to young people. Um, I, at the foundry, one of the exciting things, I know bits of this and I don't know it all, but there's lots of exciting things being happening within the foundry to address some of these issues. So on the schools front, S4, Further Maths, Technocamps have all been working hard um, to help produce materials as schools have had to rapidly move into digital delivery earlier in the year. 
Um, and the, I think the benefits of that will also continue to be reaped for years ahead. Um, there's visualization work. I know that Dan and Tom have been working with various um, uh, policy and government groups on that. Um, modeling work and Biagio and others, um, that's recently been adopted by Welsh government as, as they're you know, using sort of supercomputing facilities as, a, as, a, as the model of choice. And um, Adam and others have, um, they ha uh, well, this is starting work, have just uh, had um, a, a project uh, in uh, for debt advice in COVID. And I put at the end dot 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 and little underscore. And the um, the underscore was actually an accident. <laughs> I typed that by accident. And then I realized actually that's exactly right because I don't know. It, it's like this little flash. I couldn't work out how to make it flash in, in PowerPoint. But um, it's the flashing cursor because I, I realized I only know bits of it. So what we'd like to be nice is over the next term, if we could actually have a, a series of white matters from a lot of these, these different ones. But, but also um, please let, um, me and um, Heidi and the, the sort of foundry team know about things that are happening in this sort of area because I'm sure I only know bits of it. Um, and then finally, I'm going to say at a personal level, I've, you know, um, this is, you know, there's been really substantial things happening in foundry. So I dabble, I dabble in lots of little bits. So these are dabblings. Principally from that bit at the beginning when I was sort of like, you know, working 12 hour days and being super productive and then, you know, before I, you know, the, the things, but, but particularly any from those, that period, let's get it goes exciting. Period. So um, one thing that I, was, I, I did myself, which um, it was a 20 year outstanding project, as in it was in waiting 20 years to happen. So 20 years ago, I made this little puzzle square and it has a story of its own, but it's basically a sort of flat version of Rubik's Cube. And I wrote, coming soon, the mathematics of the puzzle square, because I knew it had a, a nice group theory story. And being aware that, um, that the Further Maths Project and that were, having, were producing lots of additional material for schools, I don't, this, I'm hoping eventually this will work into that. It's not fast enough to work into this cycle, I think. But um, I, um, I actually got round eventually to writing the mathematics of the puzzle square. So I have a, a whole, um, series describing uh, bits of group theory um, from using this, this little puzzle as a, as a way of, of um, learning little bits of group theory. So that was quite, that was a 20 year thing that I've not done for ages and, and inspired because like others, I sort of thought, what, what things that do I have that might be valuable here? Um, I'm also being, I'm also one of the co-investigators on one, at a network plus, uh, not equal, on the, the digital economy and social justice. And we were due to run a call anyway, um, earlier this year, and we, we added things, that, so there's two things. One, we've obviously had to work with projects as to how they will cope, given COVID. Um, also had a new call out where we, we, we gave a bit of an extra slant to that. But crucially also a lot of the um, working a little bit um, in terms of trying to understand the problems, a lot of the third sector organizations that are partners for this um, are having. And, um, and it really is highlighting again, perhaps the existing issues in society here that, um, that so many of these third sector organizations have lost con contact entirely with people because they just do not have almost by definition the kinds of groups who don't have digital access where they have maintained access it's often by dropping into paper so they've been using paper and newsletters a lot more than digital things um weirdly given given the nature of the situation so lots of things happening around there and the, the um adam's um debt advice project comes out of the not equal network as well or it's connected, it's being funded by that. Um, I've also been involved in a number of um, workshops uh, when we realised, we've had sort of long-term thing, but realising there's people been shifting into remote things on video in both HCI education, higher education in general. Um, and so we had a series of workshops about this, helping people share things, but also trying to take some of the lessons. So again, in my, in my sort of weekend Cody things, uh, a couple of prototypes I made, uh, and this is one again, which, Originally, the ideas for this from about seven years ago, but um, trying to uh, show video and use slides, using slides as a way of navigating video. Um, and, um, but also out of one of these workshops, um, 
came this need that people were having to for students to demonstrate physical prototypes. So I've got a little physical prototype that I made myself here, and it's got a little flag that you can move and a wheel. And the idea is this is the remote control for rock, the newly independent rock hall, um, remote, um, remote controlled um, fishing protection uh, vessels. Um, and um, so the thing on the right there is a little um, video uh, simulation of how a student might be able to demonstrate things and uh, done as a sort of prototype of a prototyping tool. So that was quite fun. Um, also been involved in Doctrine Sort here. And again, yesterday I was in the Computing um, Research Committee and this connect very much to that because I was due to be chairing the Doctrine and Sort in the British um, uh, HSI conference, and that was cancelled quite rightly early on in July. They realised it wasn't going to be sensible to run it. Uh, and it was, I think the time was such it wasn't easy to think about how to change to virtual at that point. But realise, although for the academics, waiting a year to publish something or, or publishing it somewhere else was not a big issue. But for the doctoral students, a year is a long time. And I said at the computer science um, research committee yesterday, that issue about, um, about, uh, about um, postgraduate researchers and the, the importance of the time here and, and sort of the criticality there. So we went ahead and although the conference as a whole was canceled, ran this as a virtual event and tried to find different ways of doing this. And I think, in the end, actually, I think we got, we had something which which obviously lost some of the things you'd have from a face to face, but in some ways had more, you know, because we were able to bring in more people, more experts to talk to the students, and had a really dynamic session. So we've learned a lot of lessons, perhaps for the future there. Um, and then finally, two more things. One is I did a little bit of maths modelling myself, which is quite fun because, you know, uh, I've not done a maths modelling for a while. And I was looking, I got interested in student bubbles and, um, you know, how, um, you know, what size does, do, if bubbles get big enough, what's, when, when's really crucial? What matters if, if you break between a bubble of 10 to a bubble of 20 or a bubble of 50, what goes, what happens? And, um, you know, it was, fairly frightening to be honest uh, seeing the the impacts of some of these things but also crucially I realized out of that modeling realized the importance of the cycles in and out of society as a whole and realizing of course the main impact of any um, problems we've had through COVID impact uh, COVID outbreaks within students their main impact was actually on the outer of the society as a whole. Um, so then got quoted, and, and I was sort of glad to be quoted because I think this is really crucial, but I, I sort of put a, an estimate, uh, whether this is foolish or whether it is useful, but anyway, I, I tried to put an estimate on how big that impact would be. And um, if, you, if you read any of the SAGE stuff, they always use words like amplify, and uh, they don't put numbers on. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so I, I had a very, very interesting uh, set of interactions with, um, you know, now, of course, you know, just basically every, all, all the numbers I, I saw are, are happening and more so. Um, but at the time uh, when this came up, the, the general reaction was a poo-pooing of it and saying, oh, no, no, it's no, nothing like that. Bad. Um, unfortunately, it's probably worse. But, um, but one of the things that early on, and I think it was back in April or May, I gave another Why It Matters on um, trying to understand the sort of cognitive biases and the difficulties we have both as general public but also as scientists in dealing with the issue of COVID um, and some of the, the ways that's related to other things like climate change and again this got really emphasized um, I think both even within should we say more academic or professional circumstances the, the lack of understanding of what models are for and how you use them and even something like if then um, which seems like we're uh, from a, certainly with my computing hat on is sort of like so much built in that actually thinking about those sort of statements was obviously clearly very difficult. Um, but I said that was you know one of the the interesting things that is that relates to these broad other other issues like climate change and that where there's there's similar problems. And I think one of the things that I've, I think probably every heading I've talked through all, I mean, I'm finishing now, so it won't be much longer, but every heading I've talked through, what COVID has done is very often brought up issues that were there all along for other things. And I think that's something, um, so both, I think there's some really crucial challenges that we perhaps want to face and 
you know, it'll vary between us that we want to actually deliberately address the COVID challenges. But in doing them, they're not just challenges through, say, the next year or so until, COVID, well, either we have a vaccine or we cope in some other way. Um, but I think most of these challenges are actually about things that are endemic and they're in society all along. Um, and therefore, actually, the, the, the research that, should we say, forced on us, perhaps rather than inspired by COVID, is research, I think, that will go on and be valuable in the world for, for many years to come. And I'll stop there. <laughs> okay. So, hello. Hello. Back again.